Welcome. I am Nathalie Ferrier. I am the Higgins Art Gallery curator and director. And if you have not noticed yet, this event is being recorded. Higgins Art Gallery is here for you during these difficult times. The gallery is closed to the public right now, but feel free to visit us at www.capecod.edu forward slash Higgins forward slash. We will do questions and answers at the end. So please type your question in the chat box during the presentation. Also, after the presentation, you can use the raise hand feature and your mic will be turned on. And then you can ask your question. Each semester, Higgins Art Gallery hosts three exhibits with online events and invites an artist in residence. While Higgins is close to the public, our students continue to experience the arts and the scale of the pieces by watching a video that I film and basically that uh, I prepare for each of our exhibits. During the past 10 days, our spring artist in residence, Joe Diggs, met with 80 of our students during their online class, uh, class time. So today, it is my pleasure to introduce Joe Diggs, our Cape Cod Community College Spring 2021 Artist in Residence, and our special guest speaker, historian Audrey Thomas. Thank you both for being with us today. Thank you. So I'm going to start by Joe. Uh, so Joe is a painter who lives on Micah's Pond, Cape Cod a beautiful property once owned by Joe Gomes, who was in fact Joe's grandfather. Until the, the early 70s, Micah's Pond was a, res a resort for African Americans who came to Cape Cod to spend a summer vacation during racial segregation. Audrey Thomas is a historian with a master's in historic preservation from the University of Georgia. Three years ago, I had the privilege to meet Audrey and spend some time with her. Audrey was then the Truro Historical Society Museum Director. Audrey's research delved into the history of African American travel and the guidebooks used to navigate the, segre the segregated landscape. She currently works as the survey specialist for the North Carolina State Historic Preservation Office. Audrey is zooming from Asheville, North Carolina. So yesterday, while Joe and I were meeting with Professor Sarah Ringler's drawing class, one of the students asked Joe which of his paintings was his favorite. And Joe replied, my favorite painting is my next one. Right. Joe, <laughs> Joe says his work has always assisted him with life. The process of painting has helped him emotionally by providing a physical escape. Joe paints from observation but allows his heart the freedom to be spontaneous, which spawns new work. Blending figuration and abstraction gives Joe the space to make emotionally hypnotic gestural works. An example of this is a series dedicated to the late James Bird Jr. A later series named Ballers, referring to the decline of African American men in Major League Baseball was a point of departure into the world of racial inequalities. Realizing the importance of celebrating the positive in life, Joe's latest works reflect a more romantic aspect of his life as an African-American man pursuing his dreams. Joe was born in France to a military family that has supported his artistic and athletic desires. 
Joe graduated first from Southeastern Massachusetts University. Today, it is called University of Massachusetts Dartmouth with a bachelor's degree in fine art painting. Recently, he completed a master's of fine arts, um, a degree that was with the Massachusetts College of Art and Design. And I did, in fact, the same program as Joe. Joe is represented by Berta Walker Gallery in Provincetown, Massachusetts. His work was recently added to the Provincetown Art Association and Museum. So while presenting his artwork, Joe will share his family story from the time his ancestors landed on Cape Cod from Cape Verde. And now let's look at the video of Joe's exhibit. Like I said, it's pretty obvious, you know what I mean? So I don't I don't really kind of look at it like any other way. Just like kind of go, yeah, it was definitely about segregation. It was definitely about, you know, why people stayed here, why people stayed there, you know? But why people did come and visit, stay at our place as well. people stayed here, why people stayed there, you know, but why people did come and visit, stay at our place as well. So, uh, yeah, that's what grandpa did. That's what I do. I do the same thing just 50 years later. 
the bottom line is, is that's the reason why I called it generations is because it's it's from generations from you know one person to the next by his third generation running this business. You know, Joe's at Michael's Pond Summer Rentals. There's there only certain places where people of color could actually travel and feel comfortable. Um, uh, and we're researching to see where uh, Micah's Pond was. And there, it was in a book. We're not sure if it's the actual green book or something that was similar to it. As part of his many businesses that he developed, he also had a place called Joe's Twin Villa. Now, Joe's Twin Villa was a bar, really kind of a meeting place. And it was actually the place where Grandpa was most of his time. And so I knew after four o'clock every day I could go and visit him at Joe's. So it was a local hangout, uh, a place where workers really met. It was it was a really a workers kind of a bar. And then the interior of Joe's, this is the interior of the place. We, it was one of the only places you could go and cut a rug, really get really get down with some good dancing. So the music was there, and uh, so the arches were part of the interior. So this is going low at Joe's. And the neat part is there's a character here jumping. And we, for a long time, we didn't allow anybody to jump because, because we had records. And back in the record days, they had the DJ playing on the records. Uh, and this is the DJ stand. This is Weepin' Willie, but this is the DJ stand behind him. And uh, so there was a sign that said, no jumping while dancing. And it's, you know, just because people jump and the records would skip. Uh, Weepin' Willie he was the elder statesman of the blues in Boston. He was uh, quite the showman. This is the interior of Joe's. The gold is the interior of Joe's. The, this, this piece is called, Can I Use the Ladies' Room? So it was one of the tricks that a lot of you know, ladies tried to use at the time just to get in. There'd be a, a line of 14, uh, 45 minutes to get into the joint. And uh, so we'd open the door, somebody would knock on the door, just we'd open up and say, can I use the ladies' room? And, you know, of course, you'd have to have somebody escort them to the ladies' room or just say no, which was always difficult. So I decided to come up with a little, little piece with it. These, this is uh, part of my Chalk Line Baller series. Uh, the series started, well, it started because I saw a photograph in my father's yearbook of this player. Uh, Mr. Jones down in, he, was, he played in a, in a league down in Virginia. Uh, so I was a flight attendant with U.S. Airways, and I was getting my hair cut on, in a place called The Hill in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. And I was talking to the barber, and I was like, wow, these buildings all around you are really gorgeous old buildings. And the neighborhood's kind of falling apart. And he's like, yeah, back in the day when the Negro Leagues were here, we had two teams. And that basically was our economy. So the minority co uh, you know, economy was based on the Negro Leagues. And I, that just kept on spinning in my mind. And about a, a couple of years later, I came home and I grabbed that photograph again. And I had been playing with the idea of using x-rays. And I thought, you know, x-rays are perfect for a further evaluation. You want to look deeper into it. You want to understand what these are, what's going on inside. So I thought, well, great. What really happened with that economy was you know, when Jackie Robinson in, what, 47 or whatever it was, became a Major League Baseball player, it collapsed the whole economy of all the Negro League. So all that money just went right out of, out of Black America. And then you'd think, well, that's great because now they're going into the Major Leagues and they'll make big money. Well, even to this day, I think the league is, what, is about 5.5% Black. The rest, of the, all, the, the rest of the people of color are all from the Latino Leagues. So they're not black Americans, they're actually, you know, men of color, no doubt, which is great to see, but the economy never was brought back into the black, black community. So after further evaluation, you realize that we got screwed with brass tacks. This is called the rooster's teeth in tile. Um, the idea was really kind of, um, I was playing with the idea of, of x-rays in general, and, you know, for this, just to look deeper into it. And the idea of these teeth came to me with the idea of a rooster protecting, you know, its, uh, its hens. So it's all about protection and strength. And so I'd like the teeth are strong and, and the roosters are protecting the roost. This is very exciting to be able to hang this the way that we have, because it very much, it reminds me of how my studio is set up. Um, a lot of times what I do is I'll, I'll work these uh, images and then I'll put images on top of images. Uh, for a whole bunch of reasons, actually. The layering aspect, it takes me from one, one uh, subject matter to the next, but also it's, they're, they're all involved with what I'm dealing with at the time. So 
uh, the major pieces about COVID in the background. And um, so the, these other pieces were developed, you know, around the same time or, you know, so this was a, developed first and then these were put on top of them afterwards. So it was very cool to be able to take, uh, you know, a situation that I was talking about in the past with my grandmother, you know, and then put it into what we're dealing with, with the problems that I'm dealing with right now with COVID and racism and inequalities and that kind of stuff to these just going to a total abstracted world of just kind of dealing with space, dealing with time, dealing with tension, stress. So there's a lot of stress and tension in these pieces. Uh, that's the reason why it's done. The, I, the idea is to be able to develop this into a point where it becomes a piece of art in, so, in itself with just, you know, uh, layers of, of paintings on top of paintings. This is a, a piece that uh, I've worked on. It's about my mom, actually. She just passed away in December. And uh, so I wanted to do a piece of, uh, she, her, her main name is Rose. And so there was, it was based on roses originally. And then I was just like, she's all flowers. So I just decided to paint uh, flowers. And then I started adding things that I wanted to, uh, to kind of like just hard, hard, hardscapes inside the, the, the flowers to just to kind of have a, have a little space of me in between her. And that's kind of where this is going. It's just all just movements about mom. And what's really nice in the show is I was able to put the piece that I did about her mother and her passing. This is a, this is a piece that's called She Danced on the, on the Mystic. When my grandmother, when she passed away, she asked to, to cast her, her uh, body into the Mystic River. And so she kind of floated around the Mystic River before she disappeared. So I did this piece to memorialize her, her life. Thank you all for being so numerous and thank you for watching. And now I'm going to turn to Joe and um, you can start your beautiful presentation. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you so much. And thank you everybody for coming today. And um, I wanna really thank Sasha for doing such a great job with the, uh, with the video. And, and really thank you, Natalie, for, for all everything that you've done and, and especially the, the Cape Cod Community College for supporting this. Um, you know, community-based art and community-based everything is important as far as I'm concerned. Um, so we're going to start with the presentation. Uh, the presentation, uh, there'll it, be a little bit of, uh, of returning to some of the, the things that we've seen in the film, um, but we'll get a chance to break it down further. And I hope that I hope that everyone gets a moment where they can ask a question or two. Um, I'm really happy that a, a few of the people who showed up today are, are part of my, my summer family, the people who would come here year after year for 40, 50 years. I, I never made it to their houses. They always came here and spent two weeks in the summertime. So you got to know them one way or another. So. Um, but I'd like to start with the uh, the video, and we will move we'll, we'll move on, and we'll have some questions afterwards. So this is me in the studio. Uh, I was actually having a uh, uh, interview at the time with a friend, Liz McLean. She was uh, and took the photograph, and we were talking about exactly what uh, I was saying at the gallery the other uh, in the other video. This is the how I hang my work in my studio. 
layers and layers of paintings on top of each other. Uh, what it does is it, it allows me that opportunity to kind of get them all to play with each other. So uh, to introduce myself, I am the third child of George and Deborah Diggs. I am um, my older sister, Sharon, uh, wanted to be a nurse at a young age and she is now a nurse and getting ready to retire from being a nurse. Uh, I had an older brother, Craig, who passed away at the age of 19, who was actually the, the one who introduced me to art. Uh, and then I have a younger brother, Kip. Kip is, uh, uh, was a world champion boxer. And now he is the first black state representative to represent the town, the township of Barnstable. So, so uh, we've been very fortunate to be able to have two great parents that uh, sent us on a very good track of life. So speaking of that track, I'd like to go on and talk about my mother. She was a Rose, Deborah Rose. I did this collage for her. I believe it was somewhere like my sophomore, junior year in college. I'm not really sure, but I was playing some games with, uh, with, uh, with collage and power, the power of an image. Uh, as you can see, she was just absolutely beautiful. So the Rose and the whole thing kind of fit very well together. Uh, she was, uh, both my mother and my father are both single children. And so with that was a weird dynamic you know, with a group of four kids in the house. So uh, it was always odd to, to, to see their point of view. Uh, as we move on, my father is the gentleman on the right. He is uh, with uh, Jim Backus. They were, I found this photograph in my father's yearbook. Well, what they considered a yearbook at the time, I guess it was, uh, it was pictures of seniors. It was a senior, senior picture yearbook, but then at the end of the yearbook, it was just pretty much an album cup book with just, photo albums with different different photos in it and I found a lot of my source material in here I've done a lot of work about my father and I've also done a lot of just just family work in general but what really struck me about this photograph was that you know this is 1950 and my father was riding this horse called Star and he was riding in the Centerville Parade as Paul Revere and you know we go we talk about all the racial issues that we have uh, now and you think geez how was there a, a black man who rode the horses Paul Revere in the 50s and here we are in this day and age still dealing with the same issues. So uh, the reason why this piece was made this way, and I'll, we'll, we'll show that on the, on the next, next slide, is that I wanted to show the sign. Uh, this was written actually as is. This is the photograph as of, of the album co uh, itself, and it's George Riding Star. So I flattened it out. I felt it was a star. It was, it was a, truly a sign that, you know, to make a sign out of this painting. So I made a painting with this, uh, as my father is a sign, and I put the, you know, George Diggs Riding Star as uh, in circa 1950 uh, as Paul Revere. And the background, of course, is painted in red, white, and blue because it was 4th of July and uh, muted red, white, and blues, because there's always this question that I have about, uh, about is it, how is it to be proud to be an American? Are you proud to be an American? So I go through these kind of little questions and you can see that the temperature of the colors kind of change because of that. Um, moving on, I'd uh, like to point out my grandparents. Now, this is Chester, right, and Alice Rose. Uh, she was, her maiden name is, uh, is Booker. Uh, Chester uh, had a love for avionics, and he was uh, part of uh, the, the tip, making the Tip O'Neill Tunnel. Uh, quite an individual. As you can see, they always dress to the nines. Uh, he is the first of my grandmother's three husbands, uh, but uh, he was a very polarizing, very, very big figure in my life. Uh, got to meet him in, my, in an older stage of my life, and it was I'm just wonderful that I got a chance to meet him, and now I've reconnected with all the family on that side. Uh, my grandmother was a seamstress. She was a stream, seamstress for the fine leans. Uh, she, uh, she was known for making all the gowns for everybody. She made it from anything from, you know, prom dresses to wedding gowns, the whole thing, just the whole nine. Uh, so I guess that's where my, when I think about where my art comes from or the use of my hands, it probably comes from this line of, of makers. Uh, my, my, my grandmother was just an incredible woman in her own right. And uh, I did this next painting, uh, next piece that was, that's about her. That's, that's, that's her right there. Uh, so the, the window in the background is actually, this is her house in West Medford, Massachusetts. And if you looked out that window, you'd see the Mystic River. 
So that's why that tie of her, uh, actually her remains floating in the river were, was, is so important. The kimono or, or gown that she was wearing at the time was just, you know, it's full of gold and may. Her favorite color was pink. Uh, she was very lively, very happy, very, very, just a fun lady to be around. So I painted her in that way. We'll move on. This is my father's mother. And this is my grandfather, Joe Gomes. Travis Miller is her maiden name. She was, she was uh, born up in Amherst, Virginia, in the center of Virginia. Uh, she lived near a place called Browntown, where a lot of our relatives lived, and it's where the brown people lived in Browntown. Uh, and the gentleman next to her is Joseph Gomes. He's the man that I was named after until this day. He's just one of the most important people in my life. My grandmother left uh, Virginia and uh, I believe she moved to Maryland, to Baltimore, Maryland. Uh, and I believe that's where she met my, my paternal grandfather. Uh, he was from a place in Swickley, Pennsylvania. Uh, and they moved to Swickley, Pennsylvania. Uh, and the strange part about Swickley, Pennsylvania is uh, I got a job as a flight attendant. For, uh, I worked with US Airways for 15 years and they sent me to Swickley, Pennsylvania for training. I'd never been to Swickley before. Uh, walked down the street one day and a lady says, excuse, excuse me, are you Bunny's kid? And I go, Bunny, 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 what? I've heard that. And it's like, I'm like, yeah, that would be my father. I'm like, yes, ma'am, I am Bunny's kid. And she said, well, my name is Mrs. Knox. If you ever want to learn about your family, come on back. I said, I'll see you tomorrow. I came back and she told me about all my family and where I could find them in the cemetery, the whole thing, you know, so incredible stories and very fortunate. So to move on. My grandfather, Joe Gomes, the man who was named after, he, uh, his father came from the Cape Verde Islands. Uh, his name was Gideon Gomes. Uh, they stopped and lived, their family lived in the, in the Howitch area. They came here, as, uh, he came here on a light ship, uh, but, and a lot of Cape Verdean men came here and family, they came here as fishermen or farmers, or they started off fishing and became farmers. Well, he was a farmer uh, with the cranberry bogs. I believe it's folklore, but uh, it was told that a lot of a lot of the the, the uh, Cape Verdean people didn't get paid a whole lot, but they were given land, or there was always some type of bartering. Well, my my grandfather's father amassed a lot of property, and uh, so he brought his homestead to Osterville here, and that's the land that I still live on to the day. So, and this is the property. You guys got to see it in the film. Uh, I built this porch in the, in the very closest building here that you're seeing, uh, um, and that's where my studio lies. Uh, the house that's in the background actually came from Wellfleet. It was sawed in half, thrown on a horse and buggy and dragged here from, from Wellfleet. None of, the, none of the houses that are on the property were built except for my studio. Everything else was brought, brought to the property. Um, so the villa, the, the cottages in themselves, had it had a spot that that where all, all people of, of color would would definitely come and as I spoke earlier about the people who come they came in the summertime and I think that they would come from everywhere I mean they would come from from Philadelphia New Jersey Washington DC you know Connecticut and they were part of our yearly residents um, at this point I think Audrey might have a little something to say about the way that they traveled around yeah, um, so I'm going to just kind of provide a little bit of historic background um, to what um, Joe's talking about with the properties that his family owned. I did my master's thesis at the University of Georgia on travel guides and African American automobility during segregation era. Um, so after emancipation and by the late 19th century, there was a small but growing middle and upper class of African Americans. Um, and with that comes disposable income and the ability to start partaking in like leisure activities and vacations. Um, and so uh, to give you guys all a refresher with Plessy v. Ferguson kind of has a big impact on what goes on um, kind of throughout much of the 20th century. Um, and that came from an incident in 1892 um, with Homer Plessy, who was one eighth black. Um, and he violated the segregation law in Louisiana by boarding a whites only train car. Um, he was arrested and charged for that and it ended up in the court system where his lawyers argued that um, the segregation law was unconstitutional under the 14th amendment. Um, however, 
uh, when this got to the Supreme Court, they did not agree with that. Um, and they argued that the 14th Amendment established legal equality, um, but that they could not eliminate social or other distinctions based on color. Um, and they also argued that segregation did not inherently mean racial inferiority. So that's where that idea of separation but equal really becomes kind of uh, cemented into American life um, and upholding racial segregation. And so, of course, that reinforced issues of segregation and discrimination in all aspects of life, but specifically today, talking about um, the way African Americans were able to travel and uh, partake in leisure and vacation. Um, so, of course, things like railways, steamboats, buses were all segregated. Um, Frederick Douglass had a quote um, talking about this, saying, as a slave, he could ride anywhere side by side with his white master, but as a freeman, he must be thrust into the smoking car. As a slave, he could go into the first cabin. As a freeman, he was not allowed abaft the wheel. An NAACP article also talked about this saying, accommodations for travel are a constant menace to every self-respecting colored person who boards our passenger tra trains. It is not unusual to find the coach provided for colored passengers to be at the same time the baggage car, mail car, the butcher's booth and the conductor's desk. So obviously those quotes kind of highlight the hypocrisy um, that went along with separate but equal. While the court system may have said that that didn't mean any racial inferiority, of course, in practice, that's exactly what we saw was this hierarchy. Um, and not only were accommodations um, you know, not equal, but passengers were often subjected to being um, you know, beaten, jailed, fined if they were thought to be kind of pushing back against those boundaries. Um, so that's kind of the traveling aspect. In terms of um, you know, vacation and leisure. There were white businesses and white vacation spots that would admit African Americans, but they often provided poor accommodations or poor services. Um, they might serve African Americans only at certain locations, like behind the back of the building or on certain days or hours. Um, white business owners found that they could exploit these racial discriminations and make an increased profit um, by offering diminished diminish services for equal pay. Um, so that led to a lot of African Americans partaking more in day travel um, to kind of limit their interactions with those businesses. Um, and as you can imagine, with all of the discrimination and segregation going on, um, it could be really difficult to have kind of that truly relaxing experience when you're trying to go on vacation. Um, and so this led to some African-American entrepreneurs creating their own businesses to cater to this emerging black market. Um, black businesses and tourist venues often near big cities with large black communities on the East Coast um, started popping up. So things like Oak Bluffs at Martha's Vineyard, Arundel on the Bay outside of DC and American Beach in Florida. And of course, a lot of beaches were segregated either strictly by law or just by social custom and norms. Uh, Maya Angelou had a quote describing Oak Bluffs, um, saying that it was a safe place where we can go as we are and not be questioned, which I think kind of highlights that idea of being able to kind of better relax when you're in an area where you're not having to worry as much about the discrimination that's going on. Um, and this trend really continued to flourish throughout the 20th century. And we talked a little bit about the um, segregation and public travel, but by the 1920s, car ownership was becoming more common for African Americans, which really becomes firmly cemented by the post-World War II era. Um, automobiles, of course, offered more freedom. You could kind of go where you wanted. You didn't have to, um, you know, worry about time schedules and things like that, but it also allowed people to avoid segregation and potential violence that came with um, things like the trains and steamboats. Um, it symbolized autonomy and physical freedom, as well as a rising social status. Um, of course, though, African Americans were still traveling in segregated landscapes, which inherently led to issues um, there. They had to know about racial customs going from town to town and be really cognizant um, of those things could vary pretty different, pretty drastically between towns, just, you know, not that far apart. Um, but they also had to worry about things like where they were going to get gas, where they were going to stop for food or go to the bathroom or where they were going to stay if they had to, if they were traveling overnight. Oftentimes businesses wouldn't provide those to African Americans. And if they did, often it was substandard accommodations. Um, one thing that surprised me a lot that I just hadn't even thought about when I was researching this, um, one of the travels, travel guides, um, this was Grayson's Travel and Business Guide, referenced the amount of African-American drivers that were responsible for wrecks because they were falling asleep at the wheel because they were just trying to, you know, get to where they were going um, and trying to, you know, minimize stopping as much as possible. So it was really important to prepare in advance. Oftentimes people would bring extra gas with them, extra food, bring pillows and blankets in case they would be sleeping in their cars overnight. 
Um, so some of these could be minor inconveniences, but it really could become life-threatening violence that was occurring. Um, there's plenty of stories of people not making it to their destinations, dealing with police harassment and local violence. Um, there's a story I read about um, when I was researching my thesis from 1948, um, the Mallard family, which was a successful African-American family down in Georgia. Um, and they were driving home when they encountered a mob, which opened fire um, on the car, killing the husband and father, whose name was Robert Mallard. No one was convicted in this case, and there are several theories exist about why it happened, um, but a prominent theory was that his white neighbors resented his success, um, which was represented in the new car that he was driving at the time. Um, and this kind of goes back to this idea, if people were seen as flaunting their wealth, that could result in white backlash against them. Um, so even if you're, um, you know, staying in your lane, so to, uh, so to speak, um, if you were seen as kind of flaunting your wealth, that could be dangerous in itself. Um, so a way to combat these issues, there's a lot of word of mouth advertisement that happened if someone went on a vacation or traveled, they might come back and tell their neighbors, you know, where they ate, where they stayed the night, things like that. Um, but another way to prepare was with the travel guides, um, which was the topic of my graduate thesis. Um, those guides were published at least by the 1930s, and the most prominent of which was the Green Book, um, which was published in 1936 to 1967 by a man named uh, Victor Green out of New York. Um, and these were seen as kind of a overground railroad that were published to give traveling African Americans valuable information about the businesses um, that might be in an area that would serve them and provide accommodations or food or whatever was needed. So these are places like the ones that Joe's family owned um, that would have been list listed um, just so people knew where it was safe to go. And then in 1964, of course, we have the Civil Rights Act, which outlawed that legal discrimination against African Americans. Um, and got rid of the idea of separate but equal. Um, so obviously that's not the you know, hard end, um, things didn't change overnight, but that's kind of the, um, you know, that was a huge step forward in progress for that discrimination and segregation. Um, so just uh, to kind of wrap this up, uh, in my own study of these, I thought that these were really important to look at because they really tell multiple stories. Um, one, of course, about the discrimination and oppression felt by African Americans throughout um, the segregation era. It shows the physical and social restrictions that were put on them, dangers in traveling, um, the spatial restrictions and how that um, shows up in our landscape today. Um, but it also talks about kind of the resistance and resilience um, of the people uh, overcoming barriers, the rise of black business, the idea of community. One thing I found really interesting um, was that Victor Green, who did the Green Books, um, didn't really make much money off those. He was employed as a postal worker in New York, um, but he saw this need that needed to be addressed um, and uh, created a business around that. Um, and the places that were listed in these books, um, the places that exist, they still kind of serve as a physical representation of this history. Obviously, as a historic preservation, that's something that I find really important. Um, this history has been largely undervalued in preservation, as well as kind of the uh, American culture at large. Um, often we find African American resources have been lost over time through things like urban renewal and highway construction. Um, places that were vacation areas, you know, now are in desirable uh, locations that are in danger of losing their historic fabric um, from development and things like that. And also that a lot of these places aren't obviously, you know, historic when you drive by them, things like restaurants, motels, gas stations, bars. So it's really important to talk to local communities, see what they think is important um, for their history to kind of be able to see what places that need to be preserved and uh, remembered in that way. Um, so of course, just to end this, not every uh, building will always be saved. I recognize that. Um, but it's important to document the stories and the places through things like oral histories and photographs and artwork like uh, like we see Joe doing. And uh, I'll turn it back over to Joe. Thank you, Robin. That was fabulous. Yeah, um, it, that brings up so many so many points that uh, that what I work for. And so here's a response to to what I do. This is the piece generations coming up next here. This is generations, and, and like I always said in the video, that basically this is my opportunity to bring old like people who had been on the property forever, and I bring them back to the property again. But the house that's uh, that you saw in the video or in even the last slide that was brought here from Wealthly, I aged it so that it was, it was like in the future, 25, 30 years in the future. And then I brought the people from the past back into it. 
So just this, this uh, just trying to keep the, the, uh, the lineage of, of the historical significance together. So, so and this is a response just to the to the property itself. So let, let me tell you, I mean, it, you know, my, 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 my studio faces right into the sunset right due west and as well as that I have Audubon society around there's just a certain amount of tranquilness and peace that comes across this property that uh, that I've never been I've traveled and I, I just it's a sacred special spot so it's my representation of that there's another piece that I did from uh, really from here. So, you know, you give yourself a little bit of leeway. I give myself a lot of leeway, actually artistic leeway to, to get the emotional qualities that I'm looking for. But, you know, the light is important. Uh, the movements are, are just super important. And uh, here we are, system. So uh, speaking of people who have, who have uh, spent their time uh, at, the, at the cottages themselves, uh, this picture of jo uh, Jester and Marge uh, Harrison, Jester uh, was a, a an actor. He was an actor. He was on sitcoms. Uh, Amen was one of his last uh, sitcoms that he was on. And uh, his wife Marge, uh, they were this. I found this uh, in my grandmother's autumn uh, photo album. And what I the reason why I, I had to to get them, I figured that they must have been here, and they definitely were at Joe's. That you know that they just needed to have they needed to come back to the property. Uh, he's just a, a granite. He's a piece of rock to me. He's solid and he's holding on to his wife. And and the cool thing about her is you know as I said earlier, my grandmother was a seamstress, so we got a lot of lessons on fashion. And you know she's a I call her Large Marge because she's a big woman. I mean look at her hands are very big. And you know the print the the print that she was wearing. I mean, my grandma would say, of course you know big women shouldn't wear prints, but Marge wore what she wanted to wear. And she wore it well, you know, the large hat, the whole thing. So, uh, you know, I took the photograph and I twisted a few things and made an atmosphere in which I felt like they could they could live in and one that was conducive to take them back in time. And uh, this is it. So this is this is how I ended up representing them. Yeah. It's not on this show, however, but uh, it just came from, an, from a past show that I just got that just finished uh, uh, two days ago. So. It's nice to have that back again. Thank you. And then when we talk about influences, you know, there, there's influences come from so many different areas. You know, uh, when I when I think of influences in general, you know, I think about you know, and we'll move to the next slide, and and I'll show you this, the, the way Joe's Twin Villa basically influenced this whole town. It was 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 amazing. Uh, you know, this was the place where everybody wanted to come and hang out on the weekends. This this place was just absolutely hopping. It was it was the joint. Uh, when my grandfather passed away, I believe that was in 77 or so, uh, my cousin JB Richardson came from from Washington DC came here and he ran it for 20 years and did an incredible job. Um, he brought his flavor to it. He brought his flavor. He, he painted the front doors red. He uh, interior, he painted black, put mirrors on the walls, brought, brought really this true blues to it, to the building. The building. My grandfather had music, but it wasn't blues all the time. He, most of the time he used local talent. It was a, kind of a local talent kind of resource. But JB went out and found talented blues players who came back and, and really rocked the house. Uh, so this is my grandfather at Joe's, and uh, so the influence of Joe's uh, just is the is the is the bottom line of what I'm working here through this series of Joe's Twin Villa. I had the opportunity to to uh, to to do a residency up at the Vermont Studio Center, and when I was there for the month, I, I just wanted to dig into stuff that I needed to deal with, personal stuff that I needed to deal with. We had lost the bar at that part, that point. The business had gone, and I was trying to rectify. My, my feelings along with the beauty of the place, with the ugly of the place, with everything that's going on. And then I, remind, I was reminded of a, a story when a lady came in and she, uh, she opened the front door and she kind of started crying. I said, excuse me, can I help you? And she said, yeah, I, I met my husband here and it's exactly like it was when I met him here and thanked me for it. And I thought it was, that was just, yeah, I mean, that's what, the, that's what it's all about. So eternally Joe's, I mean, you know, it's, it's all about the beauty, right? And the, the sky's reflected on the roof, the roof is reflected you know, in the interior windows are, are, are reflecting this beauty and, and it's this excitement. And, and so that's what the piece is all about. 
So in this whole series of Joes, I just uh, I just dug deeper. You know, what's what's it? How does it return back to the earth? How does it how does it deteriorate? How do I do? How how can I rectify that within myself? So of course it became a gold building and with silver and gold and just I just wanted to do it proper. Uh, so that's one of them. And you know it's just, uh, but it was falling apart. You know, and it's it's still here. It's still here. We still own the property. Uh, it's still it's still a part of my angst. I thought that the, I would work through this series and be done, but now I realize the series will be done when the series will be done. It's just gonna keep pushing me around a little bit, and I just have to deal with it. But it's a beautiful thing to deal with. So the ghost of Joe's. You heard me talk about that in the film. It's uh, uh you know. It's, it, it's a powerful piece because it was about powerful place encrusted in gold, you know, just a rock, rock of a, a rock that's encrusted in gold and in the atmosphere, you know, they just got that red sky, you know, it was like sailor's delight, you know what I mean? It's just, it just was just a rocking joint. We'll go to the next one. And this one was called a gym, you know, she's just a gym, just once again, that, that influence that influence was, is very, very important to me. And so I, I realized the fortunate, how fortunate I am to be able to do this. You know, there's, there's those times in all of our lives when we have uh, things that come to us that we have to deal with. You know, George Floyd was that for a lot of us uh, through this pandemic. Uh, so we'll move to the next, next slide. And, and this, this one is, is, this is where my, this was my George Floyd moment. Uh, it was back in 1989, I believe it was, when James Byrd Jr. got dragged to death. Uh, James Byrd Jr., for those of you who don't know, uh, he was just a regular guy going home one day from work and uh, a, a truck pulled over in Jasper, Texas with three, three gentlemen, three white guys. And uh, it was one of the guys he knew, I asked him if he wanted to ride home. He said, sure. They pulled, they, he jumped in the, the back of the pickup truck. They drove about a quarter of a mile, stopped, uh, got, got out, put a chain, neck, a chain around his neck and uh, dragged him to his death. Uh, so it was such a heinous thing, I couldn't handle it very well. So I came up with this idea of just this, this tight, narrow, I want to trap everybody in this tight space. And I wanted to kind of, to let them know how I felt about it. I started from a black painting. Uh, I found these shapes with his, where his chalk line body was, and it started a whole series of chalk line in, uh, subject matter. But his chalk line body pieces, were, you know, because he just his body was in pieces across this across this long road. So I I, I use those chalk line spots as as symbols. I also had was thinking about the problems that I was dealing with, and it was financial mostly. So I thought, well, you know, I'm going to take my angst and I'm all the shredded bills I have on to build a texture out of that. And I put that on, on, the, can, on the, the panel as well. And then I took out a torch and I started burning all those papers because thinking about how his body must have felt or how he, the pain he went through before his death. Uh, so that was my moment of, uh, of just like, of dealing with the pure horror that man will do to other man. Uh, so that's one of my influences. Uh, we'll move forward. And here we go with the chalk liner. This is chalk line baller. He, uh, it's, it's that story about uh, the Negro League. This is the first piece that I did before, before I got to the, uh, to the x-rays. Uh, the, the head in the background is actually my uncle. He was a, a entrepreneurial guy who was really some, someone special. And the gentleman, the, the young man that's in between the, the, the ball player and, and my uncle's head in a strength pose. Uh, he's probably, he's gotta be almost 20 now. Uh, He's a, he was a, just a pillar, a, a strong sense of hue, youth. And, and I just wanted to have, I wanted him to kind of symbolize the future, a powerful, strong uh, future. Just despite the, you know, the, the chalk line, the, the fading, the, the erasing of, of, a, of a culture that he would still, you know, just move on. Um, once again, you see the, the circles are on the ground, the chalk, the chalk line baller itself. Um, the really neat part about this painting was at one point I had the, the, the baseball player in this really solid position where of just that, that he was kind of controlling the, the scene even harder than he is now. And uh, I was really disappointed with the painting. I took out uh, some sandpaper and I started just sanding it away because it just wasn't working. And as I sanded it away, I realized that that's what it needed. It needed to show the fact that, yeah, you know, it's all disappearing. It's all, it's, 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 it's paper thin, it's tissue thin. It's just, it's disappearing. 
And uh, it's going to take the youth. It's going to take the strength of the youth to bring it, to keep us, to make it, to make it move forward. Sign of the times, right? This is where I was, uh, 16, 17, 18 years old with an Afro, you know, bell bottom pants, you know, uh, platform shoes, you know, I, I, and as I've taught the kids, uh, the, I shouldn't call them kids because they're, they're adults as well. But as I've been teaching this last uh, two weeks or so, I keep trying to remind them that remember where you are, remember your time, remember how important your time is. So other influences, uh, this is Terry Lynn Carrington. So this young lady, I've known her my old, or our lives when we grew up, she's another West Medfordite. Uh, we call her kissing cousin, her and my cousin are the best of friends. And she's always, she's, a, she's part of our family. Um, she was a child prodigy, superstar, youngest person ever, grad, uh, ever uh, accepted into Berkeley music where she is now. She's a Berkeley teacher as, as well as a, you know, an all everything artist. She, uh, she taught me a lot. She taught me one day we were at Thanksgiving and, and she, we were all getting ready to go out and play and she was going to practice. And I was like, what are you going home for? She's like, cause I'm going home to practice. I was like, come on now, you know, you, you must not want to practice that much. She goes, ah, sometimes it was a little difficult to start but once I get going, I don't want to stop. And the neatest thing about her, is there's about six years difference in age. What I really appreciate about her, she keeps teaching me. Um, here's someone who played with Ella Fitzgerald and Buddy, Buddy Rich, Max Roach, you call it, you name it, she's played with all the greats. And she keeps bringing out new people. She keeps bringing out the next new tier of great artists. Besides, she's, she's heralded, she's, she's got everything. And the last time I spoke to her, she, she talked about recreating herself. And yeah, I was a, I was a child superstar, but now, where, where, I, where am I now? What, I've got to continue to push on. So she's taught me more. And, and with this next view of her, you understand that the passion, the love is still there. And that's what it's all about. Fabulous. So influences, Jack Witten. Jack Witten, uh, so a group of us, uh, my peer group of people are, are, are really important. Uh, so one day we were all at the ICA and we, we were looking at this painting and he's like, wow, this painting is really neat. Do you see how this guy makes this stuff? And da, 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 da. we're talking about process. And the next thing he says, well, Richard Neal says, well, you know, he's a black artist, don't you? I have no clue at all. And I was like, oh, I went home and did my homework. And I was like, oh, this guy is really neat. He looks like, he looks like my family. And so, um, lo and behold, the, 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 the Brandeis Rose, uh, gallery had, had, Jack Witten was talking with, he was supposed to be there with Mark Bradford. And I had, I had actually gotten accepted by Cal Arts and I was going out there to, to uh, you know, to go to, to check out the school to see whether I wanted to, to really participate in their graduate program. And um, I met Mark Bradford and we were talking and he was telling me about his hoop skirt and all the stuff that he was doing. He's like, yeah, you come here, man. You don't have to have to paint and we can hang out and all this other stuff. And he was a really cool guy. And I was like, yeah, that'd be nice. But I really, I'm an East Coaster. I like to paint and you know, this place is, doesn't have any painting. So I didn't go, but I went to, the, to, to, uh, to see Mark and he unfortunately had a, some illness or maybe a death in the family and Jack took over the whole thing. And the, we got up afterwards and my friends pushed me over to Jack and said, hey, you know, go and talk to him. And we had a great conversation, came home, found other friends who knew him even more personal and uh, got a chance to meet him again. And it was really wonderful. Jack has since passed away, but everyone should know who he is. The next slide shows Jack's work. Uh, this is one of his many. And uh, the next slide kind of shows what I got from him was this idea of weight, paint weight, uh, this idea of, that, that, uh, of, of compression, of this idea of actually being able to, all the things that, that you've gone through in your life that you can somehow put it down in one brushstroke would be, yeah, is what we're all after. So uh, Mark Bradford, this is Mark's work for those of you who are unfamiliar with Mark and he's uh, just a fabulous painter, artist in general. He, uh, he does his take away, puts, builds up, takes away, puts back. Uh, the push and pull is incredible and his work is just phenomenal. My response to, to doing that kind of thing, the same kind of sand and peace, Sanding pigment off, putting pigment on, moving back and forth. 
So then there's local artists. These, the local scene is just incredible here in Cape Cod. And, and I think um, I, I implored all the students to go get up to Provincetown, uh, but it's not just Provincetown, it's really from Provincetown to, to Bourne. The whole Cape is full of some incredible artists. Uh, Selena Tree, uh, she has passed. Her and her husband, Bob Henry, have been just a, a pillar of, of information for me. Selena, when I met her, uh, the first time I saw her, I was uh, uh, enamored. Uh, she's just a great personality. But more importantly, I just kind of like the way that she composed her pieces. They're not only are they linear in a weird way, but then they on, then she'd use large shapes and she controlled the shapes in her composition so well. Um, I ran into this, this piece that she had done and I was told that she did this at a very young in her age. And to understand that she worked this way, it's, it's without a doubt the same artist. And then see where she was before she passed was just incredible. And I urge everybody, I mean, you know, you need to go and see Bob Henry's work. He's just incredible artist. And, and all of the, the, the canon of the oldest art history, I mean, the art community of, 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 Ma of the whole United States is right here in Provincetown. The, the lineage is just is, is, is crazy. And to have an opportunity to work at the Fine Art Work Center and be a part of these people was just important to me. My response back to her, I was fortunate enough to have this in a show just recently. So there's a whole group of artists that, that I had to discover because American art history just wouldn't allow me to do it. You know, the, you know, the, the Charles Whites, the Biggers, the, you know, the Smiths, you know, we can go on and on and on and talk about the Romeo Bearden's that all the great, 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 great black artists that were out there that just never got a chance to be seen. You know, Huey Lee Smith is just one of those guys that kind of got me. Like, you know, it, you know, it, painting art in general can be a very lonely kind of alone situation. Uh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, you know, hurdles that you need to jump past to be seen. And he just found a way to, to, to paint that very eloquently. Um, I haven't, I, I'm still working on it, but this is my response to that one. And it very much ties into what Audrey was talking about because this piece I did with my good friend and his grandson at, uh, over in Martha's Vineyard. And this is called Independence Day on Martha's Vineyard. Um, because it was one of the few places where blacks could actually buy homes. It was, you know, one of the first places. And, you know, the Northeast here, we have a lot of firsts, you know, our, our first millionaire black man was from here. He was a, uh, an admiral on, on a ship. He was a, 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 a whaler, whaler. So there's a lot of firsts here. And so we brought, we brought this young man. He's the same one with the pose. Uh, we brought him to, uh, to, to Aquina. And we, we acted like the Wampanoags and we uh, took the clay of the, of the land and smeared it all over ourselves and sat back and baked our skins for a little while. And we were all horsing around out, out in the, and we got, we, this is the photo that we got and I use it as a subject matter. Once again, those figures, the figure of James Bird Jr., the symbols that it keeps coming back. That's part of it. Of course, once again, red, white, and blue because it was 4th of July. I'm not going to go through this too much. We've already gone through. You heard the, the whole thing about the brass tax. It was part part of that ballish series, and you know, uh, there's a few more of them. I actually did a few. One's got my grandfather. He had a, my at Joe's Twin Villa. He had a baseball team. It was a softball team actually, and I I made a, a ballers uh, on, on that one as well. So politically, I found ways to say different things uh, through. Uh, the, my graduate school program, one of the things that, that I was, was impressed with is that they, they were always trying to get me to look at or approach the art in a different direction. Um, pretty much when I did anything with, with any kind of uh, relevance to, to uh, race or you know, like a strong political statement, I would, I would take a hammer out and pretty much smash somebody in the head with it, with the subject matter, just like you know, try to tr drill it into them. Well, you know, found out that it's, uh, you, know, you get more bees with honey and so uh, this is called Stormy Weather. Uh, this is when uh, Stormy Daniels came out. Um, and I, so there's a little sneak of the orange in the background. And from this, I, I started this whole series of uh, uh, old glory underneath the orange wave. There was a few uh, political paintings that I did that, that basically, unless you really wanted to take a little time to understand them, you could walk by them. But if you did take the time to understand them, you'd, it would stick with you forever. I had to find my own group of people. Like I said, I couldn't find, I couldn't find uh, it, it through the history 
uh, of American history in, in the books. Uh, so I found Mata and a whole bunch of uh, South American artists that, uh, that I knew that they weren't coming from the Western world, but they were very much clicking on what, how, I, how I felt about painting. I felt like if, if, if this is what painting is all about right here. And uh, this close stuff, the next slide shows, I, I just think this is this wonderful painting. The, I even love the, the title, The Earth is a Man. I, I think actually the, the earth is a woman because it bears a lot of fruit and it continues to. So I, I, I don't know if I agree with the earth is a man, but you know, dark on dark, light on light, dark on light, you know, colors of paint over top of colors, lying on top of, I mean, it, it's got the whole ball of wax right there. You know, what a beautiful painter. And so, so I set my mark high and I tried to hit it. And this is how I responded back. with this, uh, yeah. So the abstractions come and go, um, you know, uh, the, it's part of, it's part of my, it's, it is part of what I do, but I, on top of it, you know, there's, you know, I, I, I wanna be as, as, as worldly as what I try to paint. We'll move to the next one. So some of the influences scale, uh, I got a chance to go down to uh, the Windwood Walls, you know, in uh, outside of Miami. You know, first first weekend of every December, you know, they 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 actually invite muralists to come in and paint. And if you were ever at Wynwood, you'd you'd see these absolutely incredible murals. You can walk into them from two three miles away. Uh, the understanding of size and scale and how it works, but most importantly, how site specific work works the best. And it really it just really kind of did it, something special for me um, because I had an opportunity to to make a mural. And this is my response. Um, I was really fortunate. Uh, uh, David and Diane Munsell said to me, called me up and said, you know, Joe, I get this, this, uh, this barn. I, I'd like a BLM type of uh, a piece up on it. And I was like, yeah, let's see if we can think this through a little bit more and let's, let's see how this works out. And, and he said, whatever you want to do, Joe, you just do whatever you want to do and we'll talk about it. I'm like, all right. So I had just talked the day before to a good friend of mine, artist Jackie Reeves. And I said, Jackie, you know, if I ever get a chance to do the mural that I want, will you work with me? And she's like, heck yeah. So then I call her back like the next day. It was just so that that fluid. And I said, you know what, let's figure this out. And after a few runs of what we wanted to do, I looked at her and I said, we just need to put a James Baldwin up there. She goes, well, James Baldwin. I said, yeah, let's do James Baldwin. And and I found the quote that I wanted and there it is, you know. The interesting thing is, um, you know, I, I put this up because, and as I told David about it, um, you know, of course the site specificness is it's across the street from the library. So when somebody reads James Baldwin, they can turn around and go to the library. And if they don't know who he is, they can go and look him up. The books of all, all Baldwin books in, at Sturgis Library is, is now just, they, they've, they've increased it three times. The historical society on the left and the church on the right. I mean, it's just in the perfect position. And as you drive through, it's it's just in the woods. And someone sent out a note um, a little while ago that they were having a hard time, and they came by and they read that you know that you know not everything that is faced can be changed, but you know nothing can be can be changed unless it's faced. And said, dude, you you talked me off the edge. And uh, hey, that's what art's supposed to do. You know, I was totally humbled. Still am. It's just, a, it was a wonderful experience. Look forward to doing more of it. So I had, a, I had a trip. I was part of an art exchange in Cuba. Um, we're just gonna flip through these kind of quickly because you know, I don't want you guys to, to, to fall asleep on me, but more importantly, Cuba is, is just incredible place. Uh, uh, old next to new, uh, uh, you know, fresh. As it, and it was the mixture of people. I, I didn't feel like a black man. I felt like a man. Um, well, Wilfredo Lamb was at the Havana Museum and I got a chance to sit in front of his pieces. He was also with Mata in the book that I found. And so I was just attracted to him right away, sat right down and just, just kind of just drunk it, just, just brought it all in. Uh, and there's a little response of how I paint that I felt is somewhat similar to the way, but it, it has nothing to do with it, just the feeling of the feeling of the way that he painted. So the next, the next artist that, that, you know, so I started finding different Cuban artists that kind of really kind of shook me. Um, Moreno is one of those people. 
the the cool part about this painting is you know we see we talk about you know we've we've learned about chiaroscuro and all the different working from darks from the western world but to see it done in in this style was totally different to me and i really really enjoyed it so i thought wow like this is great this is a great learning point so uh, my response is this piece here uh, this is a bit of a close-up but it's a really small piece uh, and then uh yeah, and then there's uh, this lady, Antonia Yaritz. Uh, she was amazing. She was my new found. I, I found, you know, you feel like you found her myself, but uh, when he was in the museum, I was like, wow, look at who's this. And I had, a, I had a, we had the curator with us, so it was fantastic. So I asked the curator about her. I was like, you know, who is this lady? And she said, well, he said, let me tell you something. She's such a, she was such a powerful painter that we just left this whole wall dedicated to her. So that no one else could even could could approach upon her her space, which she deserved. Just an incredible artist. I just uh, I'm still doing some homework on her. And you know, this made me come back when I was painting these paintings. I I came back and I did one more Joe's with a little bit more heart and soul, a little bit more like just go ahead and put it out there, you know. So that was my response. Of course, like I talked about the decay, you know decaying building next to a brand new building. Uh, you know, the, the Cuban experience. So there's Joe's returning. It's the same, it was just letting it decay back, but with honor, with dignity, you know, let, letting it go, trying to find a way to let it go properly. Um, so that trip to Cuba was, was, was about humanity. It was about, people said, what, what, was, your, what, what was your takeaway from Cuba? Um, and I said, you know, it, it's not, it wasn't one thing. It was, it was a whole lot of things. That, and as you can see in this next slide, that you know, it's 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 really about like handmade hand workmanship. You know, you could tell real people were here. This is a sugar factory, and it made me think about Kerouac's sugar factory piece that she did. But more importantly, it just reminded me about humanity. It reminded me of 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 the battle that we have had, that everyone has had as people, and that you know how pride and, and all the rest of the stuff still is in, included into it. And it just made the food taste better. I said, look at the the, the music sounded better. The the experience was so pure and true. Uh, the humanity of, uh, of it all is just, it's, it's really where it's at. Uh, we all deal with the same issues. If the, next, the next picture shows that even better. Uh, you know, you know we, all, we, we bury our, our dead, we mourn, we live, we move forward. The light on this is just gorgeous. The place was, was wonderful. It was, an, it was a magical experience. Um, I look forward to getting back there again another time. So uh, um, my, I want to really talk about collaborations uh, for just a moment. I have about two other points that I'd like to make, and we'll open this up for conversation. Um, uh, my good friend Carl Lopes, a teacher, ex-teacher at Barnstable High School, a fabulous teacher at Barnstable High School, followed the lineage of great teachers at Barnstable. Uh, him and I, we've known each other for a long time, and I've had the privilege to be able to work with him. This collaboration is in its probably fourth or fifth year. It is still not done. We just keep pushing this piece of artwork back and forth to each other. There's four panels, and they all four of them are square, so, they, so you can change the shape of the painting. Uh, it looks absolutely nothing like it is right now, and it started by not looking like it, and we have just learned a lot from each other, and, and it's just there's nothing that replaces working in a collaboration with somebody. To me, you learn in a, such a different way. Uh, as this next one will show, this is a, I had the opportunity to, to teach and I taught a detention center with DYS. So these young, with young youths from the ages of like 14 to 19, uh, young males. And so we, uh, we had a, what, what they called a, uh, uh, a showcase every year. We had an opportunity to show their artwork. And what we decided to do was do a huge collaboration. This piece is like seven foot by like nine foot long. And, uh, it was purchased by KCON, Representative KCON. It now is in the state office in, in Boston. And it was very cool to see these kids who were having a little issue with the law to go up to the state house and actually talk about their artwork to a representative. It, was, uh, it makes you realize how powerful and what art can do for people. So I had this opportunity to work with a few friends and this is, uh, this is the photography of, of Grace Hopkins a fabulous photographer who uh, and friend. And so she, she was getting ready to throw a couple of these away. It didn't quite make her 
what she thought was uh, was good. And I said, can I work over top of it? And she said, sure. So she gave me a few of them. So I do these drawing doodles right over top of her paintings, which is uh, on top of her photographs. And, it, and we come up with this idea. At the same time, she, after I was finished with this, or actually when she gave this to me, she said, I have some work from my father. Her father was a very, very important artist as well. And she said, you know, if I, uh, would you like to do some work with his work? And I said, of course I would. So the next slide will represent that, that work. Now, his work is, this, is the piece on the right, the red piece with the, with the blue, uh, blue marking. Uh, my response is on the left. And I just put the two of them together and, um, and that's the finished piece. So you can work with somebody even if they're not alive. I mean, it's just amazing. And I learned a lot from him. And uh, I've got a couple of other pieces that I continue to, to, to play with. So my group of artists, we have a, a peer group, as I said earlier, it started off with like three and then it turned to four at the Katuit Center of the Arts and then the chalkboard turned to it's like six to eight of us. And then now there's about 10 or so and we get together, we'll pop some oysters and sit down and, and have, a, have a little party time. And we'll throw a piece of ca canvas or, or a piece of paper on, out, on, out and do some work. We, we came up with a name called Puppet and we would throw this up on social media. This is one of the pieces and uh, this is another one here. This is another one. So these, these opportunities are a great time for us to have dialogue and we talk about what, what, what we're doing and kind of like if, if we're overthinking over this, over that, or should we, or maybe we should do a little bit more, but it's all the conversation that it's kind of reminds me of, you know, maybe how the Cedar Street guys did it back in the old days, but this is how we're doing it now. It's COVID, COVID changed all of our lives. Um, it was just incredible. It's, it is still incredible. Uh, so this piece was put in the middle of our of my kitchen table, and I uh, we uh, decided to do lockdown with a, with a pod. And my next door neighbor, my friend next door neighbor Tina Tina Doyle, and my girlfriend Diane Kohut, we decided, okay, boom, let's sit down here and let's have a let's have a little time with each other. Um, so it's Tina's work on the far left. It's Diane's work on the far right. Neither one of them are professional artists. They are artists, obviously. But so I couldn't quite get them to move in. So I just took the middle and blew out. And that's where we are. And the next, the next slide, I actually show where this led me. It led me into really small pieces about this big, little five by seven cards and stuff, where I was just getting really frenetic with the line. And it would remind me of looking in a microscope at possibly what uh, this COVID would look like or something. I, I don't know. It just is a world of the crazy and I just felt like I needed to do something about that and that's what I did. So one of my other influences that blow is, is graffiti. I just love graffiti. There's something about graffiti because it's, it's site specific. It's so wonderful. These are great minds of these people who, who build, who do graffiti and the fact that they can do it so quickly and get out and make a statement is fabulous. Uh, this piece is, uh, is the fort of, of Havana and so this, when you're looking, this, this is facing out to the ocean. So if you're taking a boat in, you see this big eye and the mouth would be where they would slide some rifles through to shoot people. So I just thought it was absolutely incredible. So that's, that's Havana, Cuba. This is New York. Now, New York, it just, I mean, even though New York was known for its graffiti, but I find the little pieces of graffiti in New York that are most intriguing to me. This is like tucked back in a little spot. And I was like, look at this lady with her heart all bandaged up. This is incredible. So I, I took this piece, piece and I thought it was really nice to be able to do a flip back and forth between Cuba or Havana to New York. And so the next one is back to Havana again. And you know, so on this big massive green line, uh, a wall, these, these scrolling colors of, of movement that just shoots across it. And then it was kind of anchored by that big square and the big dark square in the middle. Um, I just thought this was just, just poetic, poetic way it moves. And then back to New York again, I found this one. And the only reason why I put this slide in, I'm gonna tell you guys the truth is because I'm a homebody. I love being from Cape Cod. I love being a Barnstable guy. I love you know, being able to say, yeah, this is, this is home for me. And I found this, this in New York City with Barnstable running down the right-hand side of it. And it blew me away. I was like, yeah, I got, I got, I got that. I'm gonna keep that. I'll figure a way to put that into something. And they had the nerve to have the big sexy music on the other side. So I was like, I'm okay with this. I, so, and then if we go to the next slide, this is my response to graffiti in a, in a Cuban market. 
you know, so this is an idea of an outdoor Cuban market, but I painted it loosely and moved it around. Like if I was thinking like I was like in a, you know, kind of in a graf graffiti kind of way, like a, a, a very uh, linear kind of way of drawing and stuff. So that was my response to that one. Uh, to come full circle, to bring me back home, this piece is called Soul Space. Uh, this is just uh, looking out in the pond. I find these spaces that, that I, you know, they're, they're magical. I, people ascend, they come in, they go out. I, I paint these spaces. I feel very comfortable. I feel very, it's, it's, a, it's a time when I can calm my mind. It's a, it's a spot where, where everything uh, kind of goes away and, and comfort comes in. So, and then the next, the next slide that I want to show is, is really my last slide. This is, this is a, a this is a statement that my grandfather had on the back of his, his business card back in the days when there was only three numbers for a phone number. It was like the number was like 307 or something like that. But you could easily take his name, Joseph V. Gomes, and put Joseph V. Diggs in there. Though I've never been hung up or whipped or any of the stuff that he went through. But this is my life story. And I thank you guys for being here and listening to me. I want to thank you so much, Joe. I, I don't know if you had a chance to look into the chat, but it's filled with uh, comments from people. Uh, they say, Joe, it's amazing to see how much of your work uh, and, learned, uh, and learn about your practice. Thank you so much for your openness to share on this level. Uh, amazing, beautiful work. We are privileged to see it and deepen our understanding. Uh, great to see you work all together and see your influences and your, your family history. Um, so, so basically it just goes on and on and on. So I took a lot of photos because I wanted you to not to miss that. Uh, one, of, one of them is you have such a rich ancestral story, wonderful that you have knowledge of your family history because this is often a challenge for African-Americans and then we have, thank you, Audrey, and uh, several of them, uh, gorgeous work. Uh, so thank you, thank you to both of you. Uh, it was a very, very powerful uh, presentation. <laughs> and uh, um, so basically we don't, we don't have questions, but um, I'm gonna uh, look now at the audience and, and um, go into gallery view and see if some of our guests have questions for, for Audrey or for Joe. Um, yes, I see Claudia Smith Jacobs who would like to ask a question. Say congratulations, Joe, you know, <clears throat> I love your work and it was good to see things that I hadn't even seen before. So thank you for inviting me. And to Audrey, I wanted to say, Green Book, in the 50s, when my family traveled from coast to coast, we never traveled without the Green Book. So we'd know where it was safe to stay. So you brought back a memory when you mentioned that. Okay. Claudia, thank you. It was, it was an honor to have our show together. And for those of you who don't know, we just finished the show, Claudia and I with, the, with, with Carl Lopes, right? And Robin Miller. We had, we had a nice show in Falmouth at the Falmouth Artists Guild. And, uh, and, and quite honestly, Claudia is the one who put it together. Thank you, Joe. Couldn't have done without you. It was a pleasure to work with you. Wow. And hi, Robin. I saw you in the audience too, and Laura. Okay, I have to leave now, but thank you so much for inviting me. So I'm, I'm, um, I'm checking uh, to see if other people have questions. I see some of you mentors, Joe. Wow. Oh, I see, I see Brian, Brian O'Malley. Wow. Brian? I think Bri Brian O'Malley has, has a question for us. Joe, Joe, uh, this th this was a fantastic presentation. I'm 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 most 
impressed by how you draw from your exposures and how you and how you express your your reaction to it and how it comes out in the work. I've never had the opportunity to really uh, understand that that kind of genesis of a of of a, of a work. And, and and you've done a a really nice job in in taking pieces that that moved you that 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 called to you in some way and and then your response I, I, it's been a real good learning experience i love your work it's good thank you brian i'm humbled Bob. thank you so much uh, yeah you know uh, i've been really fortunate you know call it like it is uh, i stepped into a, a gra uh, an undergraduate program with pretty much i was just a zombie of a kid you know walking through the walking through life not knowing where i was going to go next and there was a couple of guys who said to me hey you know, you got something here. I was trying to play basketball and they were like, yeah, you, you might not make it with that. And I was like, I'm definitely not a division three. I'm not going to make it for sure. <laughs> and in the fact that I was sitting on the bench didn't help anything either. So, uh, so they were like, you could come over here and maybe you might be something. To be honest with you, my professors actually took me to their houses personally and said, you know, this, you know, it might not be much, but we can do, you can do this. And, uh, and I promised them at that point in that young age that I would never stop painting. And, uh, uh, it, it's been a great, it's been a great ride. Thank you, Brian. Appreciate it. Thank you for sharing it. Really, thank you. Any other questions for Joe? Oh, Jim, Jim and Kate Peters. Oh. You can't hear me, can you? Yes, oh, yeah. Can. Okay, yeah. Uh, a great job. Uh, it's wonderful hey. seeing all this stuff together. Uh, also, I just wanted one thing I wanted to tell you that you may know or may not that Mata was in Wellfleet during World War II. And uh, he and uh, it was either Ernst or Weber were staying on the coast there on, on, the, on the back shore. It wasn't the back shore, it was called the Wellfleet, but and they got arrested because they thought it was thought that they were sending signals to German submarines. <laughs> uh, and of course it turned out to be not be true, but so they could not live there. They were taken off the Cape. Wow. And the, you can might look up some more of the history of that. I uh, will, Jim, thank uh, you. Because I don't know the whole story, but the woman, who's the woman that did the, 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 the wrote the play that I did, that was set for? The Wendy. Woman, uh, Wendy, what's her name? Kesselman. Wendy Kesselman. Oh yeah. It's her house that, uh, that uh, they stayed at. But you might look into that, that's crazy. Jim, I just- is a great you. painter, I love Mata. It, it's yeah. great to see you and Kate. <laughs> the show's amazing. Well, we, we're privileged to have stayed in one of those cottages with you. I would love for you to come back <laughs> soon. Miss you, Joe. Come on back and let's, let's have it soon, sooner than later. Come on back so we can have some more art talk and hang out with each other, I loved it. Yeah, well, it was a great show. Thank you, bro, great. love you guys. So, so we have time for one more question. Karen. Just, I, I don't know how to operate this iPad so I couldn't speak up. I just, I just am so grateful that you invited me to this show. I am so impressed with Joe. So impressed with the black history that uh, your guest Audrey told. The whole show was put together so well. I had told a few people, I just hope they got to see it. I, I, thank you, Joe. You really, you you inspired me. I got to keep painting. I, you know, you really. Uh, we need more people like I would call you a surrealist. Not in every single painting, but you see what I learned in high school. You see, you have realism in an abstract setting, and that's the definition of a surrealist. And I really think you are, you know, one of the best in your category. And just. Just do what you do. It's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank You're you. welcome. Thank you so much, Karen. And, and in the next show, we will see the, the beautiful work of your husband and, and a painting uh, of yours as well. Oh, uh, thank you. Thank you. I'm just so glad you told me about this. Or I never would have gotten to see Joe. I've seen him paint at the making art, you know, making a living thing, you know, what the uh, Cape Cod Art Center had, because I went in on his workshop to see what he did. And that's why when you keep repeating people, you get to know them. And so I got to know Joe today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. So, so I would like to 
thank everyone um, who made this event possible. First, I'm going to thank Joe for your extremely amazing, moving story and your insightful work. And I also want to thank so much Audrey for a wonderful presentation. Uh, you have uh, opened a new window to the past and uh, hopefully that window is going to remain open. Um, and I, I want to thank very much uh, our techs, uh, Vanna and Brian, for uh, helping us with all the visuals and the sound. Mm -hmm. um, and, done it without them. and I want to thank the Cape Cod Community College for uh, giving us this platform and uh, helping us to stay together in this difficult time. So thank you, thank you. Thank you all for coming so numerous. Uh, thank you for showing your love, your friendship. Um, and uh, I will see you very soon. Thank you.